Hello everyone. My name is Abby Whitlock and I'm currently assistant to the program of research at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts with Honors degree in History and European Studies from the College of William & Mary in May 2019 and I'm in my first semester of the University of Edinburgh's History Master's program. Today in my talk, Against the Mischievous Device, the Berlin Blockade as a case for de collective defense in the Western Bloc. I will discuss how the Berlin Blockade clearly highlighted the need for a military alliance to preserve the balance of power against communism in Western Europe. After providing a brief overview of the Berlin Blockade and airlift, particularly the British and RAF involvement, I will be focusing on the impact it had on Cold War policy and the impact it had on Britain's place in the post-war balance of power. After the signing of the 1945 Potsdam Agreement divided Germany into four occupation zones, the United States, France, Britain, and the Soviet Union imposed their own social, economic, and political systems in their respective zones. But the British economy was still recovering from wartime strain and was unable to fully produce the needed food requirements to sustain its zone. In order to avoid rationing back home, the British government fused its zone with the American zone, also struggling with deficit to form Bazonia in 1946. However, as more tensions arose between the four powers, there was the fear that such economic disparity would cause communism to spread throughout Germany to the rest of Europe. After more increased tensions, such as stemming from a currency reform, the Soviets imposed a partial blockade on April 1st, restricting Western access to Berlin. This further escalated on the 23rd of June, 1948, in which a full blockade of rail, road, and water routes to Western German zones and Western sectors of Berlin was in force. The Western Allies' fears of Soviet pressure further escalating had come true. By April, 1948, Royal Air Force Transport Command and the British Army of the Rhine developed a plan to fly in approximately 65 tons of supplies per day using England-based Dakota squadrons with no consideration for the two million Berliners living in Western sectors. Air routes had been confirmed and written agreements made between the four powers prior to the Soviet imposed Berlin blockade, which were approximately 20 miles wide. The daily requirement for food to feed Berlin's civil population would be estimated to be around 1,800 to 2,000 tons of food per day, approximately 900 tons of potatoes, 641 tons of flour, 106 tons of meat, and fish and 105 tons of ingredients such as cereals. The first British flights came on 25th June 1948 with three Dakotas carrying 6.5 tons of supplies into Berlin, including food. After initial flights were successful and British officials recognized the importance of maintaining presence in Berlin to upkeep German morale, plans to transport goods to the civil population were developed under the then codename Operation Plain Fair. By June 28th, RAF Chief of Staff, Lord Tutter, then reported that the RAF could transport 75 tons to Berlin per day, which increased to 400 tons per day when additional RAF aircraft arrived, and to 750 tons by early July, when repairs to the runway at Gatow Airport would be complete. The target of 75 tons was reached by 54 of the total 112 Dakotas the RAF had. With the arrival of 40 Avro York transport aircraft, which could transport 7.5 to 8.5 tons per day per flight, the number of Dakotas was re then reduced to 32. By 14 July, the daily tonnage target reached 840 tons and officials decided the most efficient force would be 40 total York transport aircraft with 60 crews and 42 Dakotas with 63 aircraft. With the Yorks, it was estimated that they could carry up to 1,000 tons. In July 1948, the Royal Air Force introduced two squadrons of short Sunderland flying boats that would then land on the River Elba and Lake Havel and carry up to 10,000 pounds per trip. Each flight would consist of carrying food and other necessities into Berlin and returning with either refugees or industrial goods. By December 1948, Sunderland transported 4,500 tons of food and British exports and also carried around 1,100 refugees for medical treatment. Despite the introduction of Sunderland flying boats and American aircraft joining the flights by July, British officials recognized that more aircraft would streamline the airlift further. With this in mind, they turned towards civil airlines to fulfill their need to fly liquid fuel into Berlin, a task deemed too hazardous for military aircraft. The main source came from Sir Alan Cobham's Flight Refueling Limited, who had pioneered air-to-air -air refueling and possessed fully equipped tanker aircraft by 1948. 
By August, the British expanded their contracts to include British airlines, such as British European Airways, and the first civil freighter aircraft arrived by the 4th of August, including a Hanley Page Halton of Bonn Air Services. A disagreement between British and American officials came in the transportation of particular goods, specifically export goods. Viewing the time spent loading export goods and after transporting goods in Germany as wasted, American pilots were hesitant to fly German goods out of Berlin. However, British officials reasoned that if Berlin-specific goods were not flown out, manufacturing firms were at an increased risk of closing and more workers would lose their jobs, thus not only further straining the airlift, but also being advantages to the Soviets ideology-wise. By the 12th of May, 1949, the Russians lifted the blockade, but flights continued for the next few months to ensure that civilians had the necessity and food and material stocks and emphasize Western commitment to the defense of Germany. On the 23rd of September, 1949, an RAF Douglas C-47 landed at Berlin Gatow with the inscription on the nose, positively the last load from Lubeck, 73,705 tons, Psalm 21, verse 11. That particular psalm highlighted the Western Allied victory in its quotation, for they intended evil against thee, they imagined a mischievous device, which they were not able to perform. And now I will be discussing the impact of the Berlin blockade on the Royal Air Force and on the Cold War as a whole. Soviet threats, especially in regards to maintaining democracy in the divided Germany, forced Western Europe and the United States to create a unified defense system in order to quickly and efficiently respond to these threats and future threats of a similar nature. This led to the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in April 1949 and, to a different extent, the Federal Republic of Germany in May 1949. In the immediate post-war years, the balance of power was seen primarily through a political and economic lens, such as the development of the Marshall Plan. However, Soviet displays of military power and aggression in the early post-war years, such as the 1948 communist coup in Czechoslovakia, the development of the Soviet atomic weapon, and the Berlin airlift, highlighted the need to create a formal military alliance system to commit to the defense of Europe and, on a wider scale, defend against the spread of communism around the globe. British Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan reiterated that the best way to contain the pressing Soviet threat was to evolve a joint Western military strategy. This was further underscored by the 1948 Treaty of Brussels, which founded the Western Union Defense Organization and provided for military, economic, social, and cultural cooperation amongst the member states and included a mutual defense clause. The founding members included Belgium, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And this treaty expanded on the 1947 Treaty of Dunkirk, a defensive pact signed between the United Kingdom and France. Early plans for this defense organization included a military command structure of the Alliance with a British Air Commander as deputy to the American Commander in the Supreme Command. In April 1949, the five Treaty of Brussels states, the United States, Canada, Portugal, Italy, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland signed the North Atlantic Treaty, which provided for the collective security and defense measures initially brought up in the Western Union Defense Organization. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was created to implement this treaty and constituted a system of collective defense where independent member states agreed to mutual defense in response to an attack by external forces, such as the Soviet Union. By winter 1950, the headquarters of the Western Union Defense Organization, created by the Treaty of Brussels, was transferred to NATO, where the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE, took on responsibility for defense of Western Europe. West Germany, whose future was secure, secured by the Berlin Airlift, joined NATO in May 1955. Although initially aimed at containing the immediate threat of the USSR, NATO's mission would expand towards containing communism and other threats, as seen until this present day. Despite the creation of collective defense measures is associated with the major legacy of the Berlin Airlift, the Berlin crisis also solidified Britain's role in the post-war balance of power in which the Royal Air Force would have a strong role to play. British involvement in the Berlin blockade and subsequent airlift was crucial not only for Britain's economic rebuilding, but it also served as an attempt to preserve Britain's presence on the world stage as a major power alongside rather than below the United States, as commonly thought. By showcasing military strength through air power and establishing the base for collective defense organizations, 
Although Western Europe looked to the United States to take the role in post-war rebuilding and movements to remain towards maintaining the balance of power in an economic, political, and military sense, the Berlin airlift and the British role in planning and execution solidified Britain's role as a major player in the post-war balance of power. Although the Brit Berlin airlift is seen as a major success, especially in mobilizing and maximizing manpower and aircraft in a relatively short period, the early days of approaching the Berlin crisis were met with a struggle. Initially, the Western allies could not agree on a course of action to break the blockade or how to at least access Berlin. Although the United States was initially looked to as the leading force in the Western allies, Washington struggled to propose a method for approaching the crisis. After General Lucius Clay, the American military governor, proposed an Anglo-American lorry convoy, it was the British cabinet, led by Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan, that proposed supplying Berlin by air. The airlift supported the British policy of staying in Berlin, avoiding another war, and proceeding with the London program. By June 1948, British officials reported that the British garrison in Berlin could be supplied by air. However, there would only be civilian population food stocks for 27 days. Foreign Secretary Bevan pushed for making the airlift a joint operation logistically and called for heavy U.S. bombers to be sent to accompany British transport aircraft. As if the airlift were conducted jointly, they could deliver 2,000 tons per day, whereas the RAF could only fly around 750 tons consistently in early approximations. This was the first step in Britain taking the initiative in post-war Cold War policy. As the first significant Cold War action where the Royal Air Force participated in, it was a turning point for both the branch and for Britain as a whole. Early logistical shortcomings, coupled with factors such as periodic personnel shortages and poor weather, forced officials to rethink the use of air power in joint military operations. With the need to fly significant weights of cargo on a regular timetable through the day every day, Extreme pressure was placed on the fixed number of Royal Air Force and United States Air Force aircraft large enough to efficiently and regularly fly such patrols. To meet this need, as in the case of the British civilian transportation, air, civilian transportation aircraft were brought in to support Royal Air Force and American transport aircraft. The Berlin Airlift highlighted the need for a large strategic and transport designed specifically for military use and the need for a logistical air fleet. The problem of transport aircraft was filled primarily by the United States Air Force and their Skymasters and supported by Royal Air Force Avro Yorks, Lancasters, Henley Page Hastings, and Dakotas. With General Robertson coordinating the British joint part of the joint operation, Royal Air Force pilots and aircraft led the first few flights in late June 1948 before the American pilots and aircraft joined. With the British at the forefront at early planning and execution of the Berlin airlift, the Royal Air Force became a key figure in the shift towards preserving the balance of power through military means, specifically through air power. To this day, the Royal Air Force plays a major role in defending NATO airspace. British involvement in planning and executing the Berlin airlift further re-strengthened the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States which was key to rebuilding British image, the British image of post-World War II and for movements towards collective defense. Military cooperation began in December 1941 with the creation of the Combined Chiefs of Staff and Military Command with authority over all Anglo-American operations. However, this was disbanded after the end of the war by June 1948, with Bevan pressing for a joint airlift operation. A cabinet committee approved a proposal of sending American B-29 bombers to bases in East Anglia with an added, if rather hidden, agenda of supporting nuclear deterrence against Soviet atomic weapons. In total, there were three approved groups of heavy bombers, with two based in American zones in Germany and one in the United Kingdom. The proposal also called for sending 82 American fighter aircraft through the United Kingdom zones in Germany. This proposal led to the establishment of the first U.S. Strategic Air Command base in Britain and put Britain at the forefront of Western defense, figuratively and literally. In 1949, the Berlin Airlift was a significant peacetime air transport operation between the American and British forces and was seen as a challenge in joint operation playing an execution which had not been seen outside of the war, but led to the creation of future collective defense organizations. Initially, Britain stepped back from leading the containment of the Soviet threat with the 1947 withdrawal of aid to Greece and Turkey. However, leadership in the Berlin airlift provided an opportunity for Britain to return to the helm. 
Under the leadership of the Labor government, Foreign Secretary Bevan and military officials like General Robertson, Britain exercised autonomy and a significant level of control and leadership in the approach to the Berlin airlift, putting faith in, putting faith in the Royal Air Force and its other sources of air power in order to push for the airlift and their own control in the planning. With such control and initiative and planning and execution, Britain influenced the establishment of not only joint military operations and collective defense alliances that they would be a part of in the upcoming years, but also pushed for the United States to have a more aggressive, hard position on the Soviet Union and its pending military threat. During the Berlin airlift from its early planning days to the sorties between 1948 to 1949, Britain lifted itself from being viewed as a sidekick to the United States and exercised considerable influence over the development of Western policy and action in the early critical phase of the Cold War. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>